Yeah, hi. Welcome to Sangam 2020, uh, Conversations with Global Leaders. And we have with us uh, Leith Greenslade, the CEO of Just Actions. Uh, you know, I have worked, I have worked with her, uh, you know, when, when she used to be very closely involved with the United Nations uh, Secretary General's initiative on every woman, every child. Uh, she was the former uh, vice chair with the MDG Health Alliance. Uh, she's a member of the US board of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Uh, Leith has also founded two global innovation teams that focus on the health of children and uh, an investment circle that supports uh, female social entrepreneurs working globally. So it's a, it's a delight to have you with us, Leith. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, So the Every Breath Counts Coalition is a, is a very large now public-private partnership um, involving companies, UN agencies, governments, NGOs, academic institutions. And we've really mobilised since COVID-19 to try and support low- and middle-income countries all across Africa and Asia and Latin America to strengthen their national responses to COVID-19. Um, we've had a special focus, and this will resonate in India, we've had a very special focus on access to medical oxygen because what we found with COVID is the one thing that's available to treat very sick patients while we wait for a vaccine and other medicines is oxygen. That's pretty much it. And yet we found that when COVID hit, many, many health facilities um, across the global south just didn't have enough oxygen to meet the needs of COVID patients. And the Indian media has, you know, every day there's another story in the Indian media about this crisis. So it's happening in a lot. So one of the things I'm most proud of is we've really been able to mobilise the global actors like the World Bank and the WHO, the Gates Foundation and others to rally to support countries to fill those oxygen gaps. Uh, there's much more work to be done. This pandemic is nowhere near over. Um, so we continue, you know, we continue to do that uh, every week. We have, a, I think, a great sense of responsibility to help countries that really, you know, when patients turn up at a hospital sick uh, and there's nothing there for them, um, I feel personally, you know, a great sense of responsibility to do what we can to help. You know, I think this is a COVID-19 is a seismic change in the way we live, all of us. You know, often in the past, there were pandemics and crises that hit a nation or a region. But this is the first time, um, certainly in, in my life, and I would argue ever, that the world has truly had to experience uh, such um, a global crisis, uh, the urgency of it. Um, it's certainly much more urgent than the climate crisis. Um, we've had to respond immediately. And I think it's going to fundamentally change the way we live, the way we do business, even the way we govern ourselves, um, even our understanding of ourselves as Americans or Indians or, or Africans. I think it's going to really change the way we think of ourselves and it's going to accelerate this um, development um, of um, ourselves as human beings on a planet in peril. Now, this has risks, but it also has huge opportunities. Um, revival of nationalism, but I think it's temporary. I think these continual global threats will meld us together and actually weaken national borders and we'll have to have solutions that are global um, and we'll start to understand ourselves as global citizens. We're not there yet, but that is, I think, more what the new normal is. Uh, groups of people who are connected by technology and who think of themselves more as global citizens. I think those voices that, that the end of globalisation is nigh, I think they're wrong. I think this is almost like the last burst of nationalism. We're sort of scrambling to hold on to the past. 
when everything that's happening, technology development, innovation, the, the, the way the planet is, is under peril, all of those mega trends call for more globalization, global structures, global governance, global institutions that are strong. Um, so I think we're sort of fighting against inevitability of the, the connection. When you think about it, it's technology that is always underwritten great changes in human experience. And we just cannot fight against these extraordinary technologies, many of them coming out of India, that will just continue to get stronger and stronger and will become more and more connected. And that will ultimately weaken, I think, these divisions of race, ethnicity, even national identity. And I see that as positive. Well, I have to refer to the US election next week. It's an election story. Um, so there's a record number of women running in the US election. And we're certainly seeing in many parts of the world, women you know, emerging out of the home, entering the paid workforce, and then seeking leadership positions, um, including in India, where, where this is an urgent priority. Um, so my greatest stories are of women really taking on leadership roles. And then you see how institutions are transformed when they come to the table. So I think the great, you know, if I, if I had to make one bet, if someone said to me, what would you invest in if you really wanted to increase the probability of peace and prosperity, overcoming some of these global challenges? My dream would be in every country, there are 50% women in ministries, in parliaments running companies, run great educational institutions like your own alma mater. Um, this to me is the trigger for a transformational change. We have a very long way to go, but some of the quality of the women running next week for the US Congress and the Senate on both sides, right? We want on both sides of, of, of politics. We want women in, in all parties of all persuasions, uh, gives me hope. And of course, they're young, many of them. So youth, uh, the youth, I'm very optimistic when I look at young people. And when you look at the demographic um, projections, uh, the, the, the populations in the South are getting younger and populations in the North are getting older. So I think in 2050, we'll have about 10 billion people in the world. Five of them will be Asian out of 10. Three out of 10 will be African and they will be young. So the future is really in the hands of young Indians, young Chinese and young Africans. These are the people that will change the world. And if half of them are women, women in India, women in China, women in Africa, that to me is our best bet to overcome some of these daunting challenges. That is the new normal that I would really believe in. The US is a really uh, in, a, in a terrible spot because women have never had a lot of support here to raise children and work. Uh, the safety net here, there is no welfare state in the United States. The safety net here is filled with holes. <laughs> um, so women, women do not find it easy to get childcare if they have to work. Parental leave is pretty much non-existent. I mean, it's a disaster for working women in, in the United States. Nevertheless, we persist with all sorts of patchwork arrangements to make it work. But yes, COVID-19 has really sent women back home because the children aren't in school. My own children, I have three teenage daughters, they're at home. Uh, they're not in school, they're, they're, they're at home doing a Zoom school. So it's very, very difficult here, but I do see it as temporary. Um, I think um, after COVID, all sorts of, I don't know that many people will go back into the traditional workplace. I think many people will stay working from home. And in a way, this is easier for women. Uh, once the kids are back at school, <laughs> you, you can work from home. So it's just this school issue, I think, that's causing a lot of women a lot of pain at the moment, and the schools will go back. So actually, I think COVID could be an opportunity to totally change the workplace. These big offices that we've built, these big expensive offices um, that are a long way from home, this big commute that people, I think many of those things will change, which is also positive.
You know, people have to buy less, consume less. There's this lovely expression from a German designer called Dieter Rams that I love. It's sort of, it's the, th it's the philosophy I am trying to embody as the new normal in my own life. Less, but better. So you consume less of everything, but the quality of each individual thing is, is, is good. So it's going to last for a long time. When I think of how my grandmother lived, she saved everything. She didn't buy a lot of things. She invested in quality things that lasted. So I think there'll be much more of, of this kind of consumer behaviour. So companies will have to fundamentally change. But also our basic things like our own diet. If there's one thing I think a lot of people could do to really help the planet, it's just change the way they eat. So this massive consumption of meat in, in Europe and, uh, and America has to change. The dairy consumption has to change. India has a huge head start here. Um, but the rest of the world has to sort of catch up. Um, there's so much we could do by just changing the way we eat, the cars we drive, and opting not to drive any cars. I, don't, I no longer have a car in the family. Um, so it's, it's more about... Uh, consuming less. When you think about the model of growth we've had, at least for the last 260 years since the Industrial Revolution, we're told all the time, buy more, buy this. The advertising is telling us all the time, more, more, more. I think that has to change. And that's going to be so hard for companies because we've built a machine, a capitalist machine, where companies have to drive for profits, which means they have to sell more and more and more. Right. I think um, certainly the stress of modern living, you know, we have all these things, but it, more stress came with it. And th there's no industry that's created more stress than the technology uh, media industry. So um, our computers, our, our, our tablets, our phones, this constant stream of information. You know, they told us that more information was good, uh, more choices are good, but actually there's a limit to the human brain. <laughs> at least until Elon Musk, you know, re, re, uh, <laughs> reformats reform, our brains with the neural link. We are limited by this instrument inside our head and it, it just can't, uh, it can't take much more, I think. Um, so the stress of modern living is extraordinary. Um, that, that will have to, and the loneliness, I think, of a lot of modern living, certainly here uh, in countries uh, in the States and Europe, where we live in these tiny little families, just mum, dad and kids, We've lost the extended family and the connection um, to, to, to relatives because we move around all the time. Uh, it can be very lonely and isolating. So I'm, I welcome the new approach um, to mental health. And I hope that after COVID, we can build societies where we're not constantly bombarded with information and demands. You know, we're working all the time now. You cannot stop working with the technology. It's always there. Um, so I, I welcome the focus on mental health, but I think we have a long way to go to know exactly what to do about it. Excellent. Oh, for sure. So the Every Breath Counts Coalition has had... Um, an excellent conversation with a team out of IT Madras and in some other partner organisations. And they developed something called the Medicab, which is a foldable, portable field hospital that can be put up with, I think, a team of four people in a few hours. And they created this uh, to help um, states respond to COVID-19. So when you, you need a hospital quickly, uh, they develop this, it goes on the back of a truck and you put it up quickly. Beautiful innovation, very affordable and very relevant beyond India. So we brought them on because we have a lot of people from Africa and Latin America, even Europe, uh, on the call. So they were blown away by the quality of the innovation. Um, and so Medicab was one that we're very excited about. But the, the next one we're having on, which we're super excited about, is the Faluda test, which has received a lot of coverage. It's the paper-based COVID-19 test out of... Um, I think the Institute for Genomics and Integrative Biology, they're coming on uh, to talk as well. So 
the quality of the innovation coming out of India for COVID-19 is exemplary. But this is part of a bigger story about innovation in India. Honestly, if you fast forward maybe a decade, I see India as almost like the innovation engine of, of the world, simply because of the mass of quality engineers and designers that you have and the institutions you have, like IIT Madras and the, the network uh, of those institutes. So it's only going to get stronger. So we're, we're very, very excited about uh, showcasing some of these innovations to the rest of the world. So the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor have been terrific partners in that, and we hope we'll get more more innovations to share. Fantastic.